coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. That fly is on that scene. You immediately roll cast upstream. You're replacing all of that upstream from the fly. So basically, you have your fly in front of you, upstream from you. You have your leader going further upstream, looping down back at you. And all you have to do is take the tip of your rod and wiggle it on the way downstream. And that fly will go upstream. That was Antoine describing how to present a fly downstream to a fish with the fly upstream from you. No fluoro, finding big fish, and the Farmington today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how are you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Click that share button in whatever app you're using right now and share the love out and help another fellow angler out there find some great content. We've got over 400 past episodes from topics and guests from all around the country. So share the love and want to thank you in advance if you had a chance to share this week. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who you know from their game-changing telescopic fly rod roof rack systems. But did you also know that Trestle just released the only universal bike rack system designed exclusively for the angler and outdoorsman? You can check out this new universal rack system at wetflyswing.com slash Trestle right now to see their full line of gear carrying products and the artist series apparel. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. Today's episode is sponsored by Togan's Fly Shop, who provides superior quality products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Togan's has been over delivering on price, service, and passion. And now you can check out that Togan's buzz for yourself. Right now you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togan's to get started. That's T-O-G-E-N-S. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Togan's online. Antoine, the French fly fisherman, is here to take us into Euro nymphing. We find out how to present your fly more effectively, how to identify big fish, and we touch on uh, many of the Farmington River hatches today. We dig in. We're heading east. We're going to be on the east coast today talking the Farmington and some other uh, topics in that area. All right, let's find out why Antoine gave up a professional skiing career for fly fishing. Here we go. Antoine, the French fly fisherman. How's it going, Antoine? Hi, Dave. How are you? Good. I struggle sometimes <clears throat> with the names. Yeah, it's like an ant and number it's like an ant and number one. Yeah, ant number one. Ant one. That's it. Yeah, yeah so uh, we're not even going to mess with your last name because uh, it's even <laughs> harder. Uh, but uh, we'll put that in the show notes. You are the French fly fisherman, which is actually makes it really easy for us people that are, you know, not, not quite as uh, intelligent and able to, to talk. Yeah, my wife, after my wife, after trying to pronounce my name for 10 years, told me you are now on known as the French fly fisherman. There you go. That was smart because that's a great marketing. It's easy to remember. It's a great marketing thing. So, and I think that's where I first saw you. Somebody reached out to me, you know, uh, one of our listeners or a few of our listeners and they, you know, had mentioned you and, and the French fly fisherman, right? That just stands out. You're like, okay, I, I kind of have an idea what that means. So, so let's uh, let's dig into that. We're going to get your whole story here. But um, so why the French fly fisherman? I mean, you have a guide service, obviously. Um, but tell me the story. Would it be easier just to go back to how you got into fly fishing? That'll tell us about the French fly fisherman. Yeah, I mean, it all comes in, into one long, big story. Basically, I worked for Orvis for years. Uh, and then after working for them, I moved to Vermont, where I work, still work for them. And I I was at, uh, at the fly fishing school for about seven years. Uh, and then, and that was with a bunch of guys there that were really nice. You know, uh, Kyle Lears, Pete Kutzer, uh, those people are really nice people. And I kind of, we kind of hang out every day all together, uh, teaching people during the day, then go fishing at night. Uh, it was just, it, it's, it's one of the part of my life that I really cherish. It was really great. Uh, so the Baton Kill is, I kind of know that river, like the back of my pocket. Uh, it was my home river at that point. So, uh, and then I found a woman that, uh, 
came to catch a fish at the school. She never caught a fish. She caught me and she never released me. <laughs> and so I've ended up by marrying her and living in Connecticut. I moved to from Vermont and moved to Connecticut and installed myself as a guide on the Farmington River. And from there, I looked at it and I'm just like, okay, so now I got to put people on fish. And that's a whole different ball game than teaching a school. So I look all over the place. I call a bunch of friends everywhere. And my research were very quick. Um, the top 10 fly fishermen on the planet, a lot of them come from the Pyrenees. There's Spain right next door. There is the thousand of France right next door. A lot of top fly fishermen live in this area. So I took a plane, went over there. And I started to meet some people there, and one introduced me to the next, and the next introduced me to another one, and et cetera, et cetera. And little by little, I got involved with a lot of people that are in the French team. And uh, it's been a great adventure since then because those people evolve nonstop. Uh, it is unstable environment. It's uh, evolution at the speed of light. Uh, every year somebody comes up with something different. So you have a dozen or two dozen new things coming up. Um, it is just fascinating. And when you look at those top 10 fly fishermen on the planet, uh, boy, they look at things differently. They just do things differently. They are just a different beast on their own. So it's been fascinating. And then uh, last year, for the first time, I decided, you know what, I can't go to Europe because of COVID, but friends could come here. So uh, I told one of my friends, listen, Jim, why don't you come over? And he said, yeah, sure. So he came over for two weeks and we fished like mad and we gave seminar all over the place and it was a blast. I mean, that guy, the first two days, he was with two other Frenchmen. I brought him to places where there's tons of fish and they were averaging like 85 fish a day. And I'm just like, okay, that's good. Uh, let's put them the following day. Let's put them in a place where it's going to be a lot harder. And I put that guy in a very difficult place and he just kept on going and still 85 fish. I mean, those guys, you put them in an airport, they find a puddle and they don't catch a fish. They don't catch a fish out of it. They catch a couple of them. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's the funny thing is they because they're and part of that is we just had a, a bus a Van Dam on and he was over there in that part of Europe and we kind of dug into a little bit on Italy and that area and he said that you know the reason those people, especially as you get down in that region further south, they're so good is that the fishing isn't that easy. And that's correct. The Italian are absolutely wonderful fishermen. Yeah, exactly. So so that's part of it, because if you go to some of these other areas where there's fishing's easy, you don't have to be as good of an angler. So, so but now on your background, you have an accent. Tell us what the accent is. Well, I'm French. So just be, be careful. I was born rude. I have an excuse. <laughs> yeah. So where were you born? So you were born. So when did you come over? So you talked about the Orvis thing. When did you come over to the U.S. the first time? I was born in Paris, and then by age 12, I was sent to the Alps to go ski. And I ski uh, competitively there until 16. Then I quit skiing. Uh, and then I went back to Paris. And then by age what, 21 or two, something like this? I met an American girl in Paris. We lived there for a couple of years. And then we moved to New York. And I lived there for 15 years. And after 15 years there, I decided enough of that nonsense and I moved to Vermont. So a couple of things there on, and just a little bit of your background, just I'm kind of interested here. So um, why did you quit uh, skiing? So you're, it sounds like you're at a high level of skiing. Why, why did you quit at 16? I broke my back. Ooh. Yes. So I have, I have 20 some screws in my back. And the first surgery, I kept on skiing. The second surgery, I kept on skiing. And then my surgeon told me, if you don't want to end up in a wheelchair, you've got to stop. 
And so I gave 30, I gave a whole bunch of skis to my son and I threw my ski boots in the garbage can and I quit skiing altogether. And it's, and it's a really hard, hard thing to do because to me, skiing is easier than walking. Uh, so it was, it was difficult, but you know what? I dream about skiing at least twice a week. So I'm in good shape. Oh, you do? No, yeah. There you go. <laughs> and boy, those turns are beautiful. And when I fall, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gosh, that is a tough one. I mean, and I, we hear this a lot, just at level, you know, the people that are fly good, great flyingers a lot of times are also great athletes in other sports, right? Yeah. I've been addicted to speed at a young age. So how do you get your feel now if you don't get the speed through skiing? Um... I build wa automatic watches. I tie a lot of fly, and I am involved in my fly fishing to the full extent of my knowledge. And I try to deepen that knowledge every single day to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, you're fully into it. This is, this is awesome. So. So well, that takes us, um, and we'll, we might circle back on some of these other uh, some of these other topics, some questions I have along the way. But let, let's dig into on you know where you're at. Essentially, you're at the Orvis School, which is something interesting too. Let's just uh, touch on that really quick before we jump into you know the Connecticut. So what was that like? How did you get involved in one of the? I mean, the Orvis, right? That's one of the biggest companies out there. Um, and yeah, how how did that begin? So, so basically, I mean, all this school, I kind of knock on their door. I met the, the head the head of the school, which is Trollmeyer, and I told him, listen, I, I'd like to do this. And uh, and the guy says, sure, just come on over. And he helped me, introduced me to people, do it, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, got, in, I got into it because of, of him. I mean, he really helped me getting in uh, because it's not it's not an easy place to get in. Uh, and then it's a fascinating thing. You learn to speak in public. Uh, you teach people who don't know what fly fishing is. Um, it's a very, very interesting uh, place. Uh, you teach some advanced class. Um, you do a, lo a lot of, you know, when we were with Pete and Carl, we did a lot of, you know, research here and there on, you know, how do we cast, you know, we film slow motion uh, cast and see what happened in virtually in, in the air at slow motion. It, it was just great. It was, um, it was wonderful. And then when I left the school and I moved to Connecticut, I stay friends with all those people. Um, so, you know, from time to time, if uh, they need me to go over there and do something, I'll go. Uh, you know, we talk every year. We try to hang out once a year and have a beer together. Uh, it's just a great group of people. We had very, a lot of fun memory during that period of time. Pete moved to the corporate world. Kyle also moved to the corporate world. Troll is still doing the same thing, so he's still at the school. Uh, and uh, no, it's uh, it's just uh, Orvis is a Orvis is a great company. It's uh, it's family oriented. It's very friendly. I had a blast during that period of time. It was one of my cherished times. We've had a number of Orvis episodes. I'm not sure how many now, but we've had uh, Pete on and, you know, Tom and uh, and some of the other folks there. Um, who was, when you were there, who was the head honcho at, at Orvis? Who was the, um, who in the family? I know it was the family. Who was running the show there? It was Dave, Dave Perkins. Oh, Dave Perkins. Okay, yeah. He, I haven't talked to, I heard, uh, we talked to Perk a while back. So Dave is Perk's brother? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Per no, it's it's, a, it's his son. Dave is his son. Perk is the dad, and Dave is his son. That's right. Cool. So, so that's the Orvis. We love Orvis. Orvis is one of the great companies. No, it, it is it is a great company. We can say whatever we want, and some people can scream left and right, but it's still a great company, and that's the way it is. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. So that gives us your Orvis background. So now you have a great background in teaching and, and all of that, and you're, you're going. So now you move to Connecticut, and so... What did the Connecticut... So why Connecticut? Why, why you could have moved anywhere? Why, why Connecticut? Well, because my, my new wife lives in Connecticut. So I moved to, to her place. And then, uh, and then I see the Farmington River. I'm just like, okay, let's fish there. That's it. Did you know the Farmington was a famous uh, river? Yes. I used to fish it a lot before. When I, was, when I was in New York, I was spending all my time on the Farmington River. Yeah. 
And so let's go there on the Farmington really quick. Why is that? I mean, it's a tailwater fishery. What, why is the Farmington such a well-known river out there around the country? So there are a few factors. It's a tailwater fishery. Uh, last summer in mid-August, water coming out of the dam was 48 degrees, 49 degrees. Uh, I mean, it's cold. Uh, you, you could be fishing in a 90-degree weather day, and the water is still cold. We have cold water uh, all summer long. It's just a beautiful fishery. There are tons of wild fish in it. Mm. Wild brook trout? So brown reproduce very, very well in the Farmington. So we pick up those brown that have, you know, golden belly and red spots all over the place with the blue cheek and red adipose. I mean, it's just, they're just gorgeous fish. So so that's nice. So they're stock fish, they're holdover, there's wild fish. We have rainbows, we have brown, we have brook. We have a whole bunch of activity going on. And uh, no, it's just a beautiful river. It's just great, yeah. This is good. So I want to take us, you know, into the Farmington if, you know, folks are out there or maybe thinking about a trip. Um, I guess, you know, if they were to call you, let's, uh, I always like to start there because it gives, you're a guide. That's what you do there. If we call you up and we say, hey, we want to, we're going to be in the area, you know, sometime this year. What's the, you know, take us there first. Could you just fish it year round? Are there better times to go? What would you recommend? So we can fish year round. There's no doubt about it. Uh, better time to fish, yes, obviously, like everywhere else. You know, it's in the late spring. Um, during the summer is great, and in the fall. The fall is an outstanding time to fish. Like or from after the leaves fall by mid-October to Christmas time, it is a bonanza. And not too many come, so the, the river is fairly... Uh, Pretty much, there's no angler in it, so you can pick and choose where you want to be, where you want to do what you want to do. It's it's a great time to fish. Okay, so the fall is good. And what would you be, you know, if we're like, how do you get your clients into fish out there? So, um, how do I get my clients? Yeah, I mean, are you are you focusing more on? I know you do some euro nymphing. You have that. Obviously, you talked about the the competition stuff over in the French and all that. Yeah, there is a there is a lot of word to mouse. I mean, I don't advertise. Uh, just people hear about me and come. Uh, I mean, I, and I, and that keeps me busy all year. Uh, that's it. And I can't, I can't, I can't split myself. So no, that's good. So, so basically, if somebody calls you up and they say, "Hey, I want to do a guide trip," but let's just take it to the the early fall. Um, and when when they're on the river, are they thinking? Are they nymphing? Are they dry fly fishing? Wet flies? What are they doing? So the, basically, the, the, the way it goes is the following. If they call me, we have all different levels of fly fishermen, number one. Uh, so I do from beginners all the way to competitors. Uh, and then I do almost any kind of fishing that can be done in that water. Uh, and then uh, depending on what the river does, because Mother, mother Nature it will destroy your plan in a heartbeat. Uh, so, you know, I usually do not have a plan in advance. I meet my client knowing approximately I talk to them. So I know approximately where they are, where they situate themselves in the world of fly fishing. And then when I meet them, depending on the wind, the water level, the water tap, the bug activity, then we decide on a plan and we just execute the plan from there. Uh, because... Every day is different. Uh, it's just it's just impossible to plan ahead of time. Yeah, that that would be suicidal. Yeah, if somebody wanted to come to you and they said, "I really want to learn some of the competition tactics or Euro nymphing," what what would that look like? So that would would like uh, the first thing would be, for example, we would spend anywhere from a half an hour to an hour. Uh, looking at the equipment because those people don't use what we use here. So, so, so the angler can understand what kind of equipment we use and why. Uh, so there is, you know, the leader we use are different. The fly we use are different. Uh, the way we cast is different. The way we present is different. So all of this has to be explained first. So we don't have to have fish distraction on the river while we're trying to learn this. 
And then when we have all of this under our, our belt and we start to understand what's going on, then we go to the river and we apply. So we jump in the water and then we apply what we talk about and we dissect. And some people are very interested in uh, getting a result right away. Some people are very interested in um, the technique part of it. Some people are very interested in all different, there's all different type of, um, I would say, attraction to it. So depending on what the attraction of the angler is, that's where we're going to go. I mean, all, eventually, all my trip are completely customized to the angler. I mean, to the full extent. I mean, just, I'm just, my goal is for them to reach their goal. Yeah. What, what if their goal is, what if they haven't done it or they've tried it a couple of times, but really struggled with a lot of it, like even the casting. Let's start there. So if somebody is struggling with that, where do you start? So let's, let's, for example, we have somebody who comes and they're struggling with their casting. First thing we do is tweak their cast. I mean, tweaking a cast doesn't take long. And if you can cast 30 feet, you're in good shape. And what would be the, what would be the line? Take us to the gear a little bit on the you know, if we were doing some, and do you, do you consider it like, what do you call yours? Cause I know some people have different names for Euro nymphing, dynamic nymphing, right? Different stuff. Do you call it Euro nymphing or what's your style? I call it, I call it European nymphing. Yes. Yeah. European nymphing. Okay. I mean, basically it's, it's a big umbrella that includes French nymphing, Spanish nymphing and Czech nymphing. And the whole thing is called European nymphing. That's right. No, and and it's good. We, we actually, every time I go through, I always love to go back to the start because we've had a bunch of, you know, Team USA folks on here and we've, we've heard some of the stories about how it started. So we'll put some uh, links to some of those shows in the, in the show notes. And so when you get going there, you have, you know, somebody that may be struggling casting. Talk about the gear. What, what is that? What does your gear look like? What would they be using here? Like rod reel line, stuff like that. So basically, uh, on a dry fly point of view, I have two setups. I have a setup that I can use, for example, in the parking lot. So that setup has never seen the water. They've never caught a fish. They've ne never done anything. We're here in the parking lot tweaking our cask, our cast. Then whatever we use on the river, all my equipment is very expensive. So I'm using all the latest of the Elios line from all this. I'm, uh, and then Orvis is going to scream at me, but I'm using other brand, but I'm using all their top of the line uh, equipment. All my rod are around $1,000 a piece. All my reel are about 500 and change a piece. I mean, I use expensive stuff. I use expensive fly line. I build my own leader. I mean, everything is expensive and customized. What is the line? Because that is a question on the line. Because with the Euro, you know, uh, one of those lines is not quite the same. Talk about what line you use. So I use the competitive line, which is, you know, those double zero line or those very thin uh, line. Uh, because basically we're not casting a fly line, we're casting a leader. So the least amount of weight um, and then the maximum amount of transfer we can have from the fly line to the leader that's what we're looking for. So we're looking for a fly line that is as, as small as possible. So it's clored closer to the leader. And then I feel I fish a lot of micro leader. Uh, I fish a lot of, and it all depends again, you know, somebody who wants to start your nymphing, we're going to use a beginner leader at the beginning. And then as they absorb, we're going to go down in size to towards the micro leader and to get more sensitive, to get more precise. But I don't put them right off, off the bat on something very thin. Um, you know, it's just if they come up and I see their equipment and they're already on the thin stuff, then we go from where they are and we move forward. Okay. So, and on the uh, competitive line, is there a, just so somebody could look at that online, what, what would that be? Is there a, like a, a brand name type? You have Scientific Angler that has good line. Uh, I like them. I, that's what I use. Okay, that's the scientific anglers. That's their. Is it called their comp line? They have a comp line. I don't exactly know the name of it, but if you look online, you'll find them. I mean, they they have different one and different diameters, and, and usually I try to get the thinnest, thinnest one. one. And then what's the um, and then the rod? What is like the length and weight of your rod? 
So for your name thing, my shortest rod is nine nine, and so nine foot nine inches. And my longest one is eleven and a half. And they're two weight and three weight. So two and three weight. Okay. So when would you use, say, the longer, the eleven and a half versus the the nine nine? So my my longer one is going to be my going to be my go on. Like for example, I fish the black series from all this, which is a three weight. It's eleven and a half. It is extremely light. Uh, it is a beautiful rod, and that's going to be my go all condition type rod. And then for um, you know summer, very very low water pocket fishing, very spooky situation. Uh, ankle deep water. I mean, you're just struggling to find a fish in there. Uh, then I use, uh, sorry, all this. I use the RD uh, nine foot nine inches to weight, and that is that is that is a very light rod, very precise, uh, very gentle, uh, extremely sensitive. Um, so that's that because at, at that point, a very long rod may interfere. Uh, with smaller fly, you made et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay, that's perfect. And I'm and I'm looking at the scientific angers, the mastery Euro tactical nymph mono, yeah, for European style str- nymphing. So so that's SA. And then so basically, yeah, the smaller or shorter rods are going to be more tactical when you really are sneaking around, right? You need to be a little stealthier, maybe. Right, or like little little streams, little brook, you know, little spot where you're just tapping fly size eighteen and smaller. That's you know that's you know short leader that you you're just you know hammering little places like this. Drift Hook has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Their professionally curated fly fishing kits are crafted so you can catch more on your next outing. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy to follow guides. I've got the Nymph box right here in my pack, and I've been loving this. They've got everything from the tiny zebra midges with a little flash or all the way up to their large go-to guide flies. This box has you covered for all conditions. And were you thinking Euro Nymphs? They got that covered as well. Beautiful Euro Nymph flies, all the key flies you need to get going, whether you're a brand new to it or a veteran, Drift Hook has the flies for you. Along with their nymph boxes, they have dry fly streamers and all the education to go along with all these as well. These are fly shop quality flies, hand tied and inspected before being carefully packed neatly into these boxes. And Matt personally packs and prepares these boxes like he was tucking the kids in for bed at night. Cozy, comfortable, and just the right amount of love. Whether you're an experienced angler who needs to stock up on some flies or get a great gift for the family, uh, Drift Hook has you covered. Check them out right now. That's Drift Hook, wetflyswing.com slash Drift Hook and use swing at checkout to get 15% off your next order. You support this podcast and small business by checking out Drift Hook right now. Okay, perfect. So we got that and... And so the next step would be that leader to get, cause that's a big part of it. So how would you start somebody out who maybe is not a super expert? What, what would be the, how would you start them? And then how would you move them down into the lighter stuff? Okay. So when it comes to leader, uh, there is a whole array of them. Uh, so if a beginner comes up, I will start with a fairly thick leader. And we're going to start with probably a thicker tippet, and we're probably going to start with bigger flies. So they get a feel of the cast. They have an idea of how it moves. They get used to see the cider and manipulate all that. And then, and then that leader is probably going to be the equivalent of, uh, you know, a one or two x leader somewhere around there taper down to, you know, 5X. And then we go thinner, a little bit thinner after that, and we go with leaders that are, you know, 3X in diameters. And then we start to add some stretchy portion of tippets and uh, leader material. Uh, The stretch is very important. 
uh, I do not, and that is that is a very discussion that a lot of people can say the opposite, and that's fine, and that's fine. It's an open discussion, but I'm looking for I'm looking for stretchy, I'm looking for limpiness, I'm looking for soft, I'm looking I'm not looking at pound test, never. I don't even know what pound test is on my on my system. I'm not interested in pound test. You don't pull you don't pull a cargo ship with a chain. You pull a cargo ship with a with a rope because it's stretch, and it's the same. It's the same with fishing. Why you don't you don't fish with a broomstick? You fish with a rod that bends. Like how come your leader is so stiff? How come your leader is so on stretchy? That is not a good idea, to me. Uh, so that's that's what I'm looking for. And then we go much thinner into the micro leader type thing that are very. Um, very specific, where you can use different type of stretchiness, different type of lengths, different type of ciders. Sometimes you have multiple ciders on it, and that really depends on the situation. And I'll remember that phrase from Troll Myers, and he told me this the first day of uh, the school. He told me there is only one sentence true in fly fishing. And I say, oh, what is it? And he said, well, the situation will tell you what to do. And that's the only real thing. And so, yes, we, as we get into the thinner material, as we get more into uh, things that are more productive, I would say, then we have to change a lot. We have, I mean, we move a lot, we change a lot, we evolve a lot, we change the position of our body, we change the cast, we change all the time. Uh, changing is key. If you, I mean, you ask any angler, most fish caught on the first three casts. So we try to replicate that. Let's, let's put three casts into a new place or three different casts or three different presentations. And then we move and we do, do it differently. I mean, that's, that's you know, it being, being polyvalent, being um, proactive, being dynamic, like uh, George Daniel will say. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the success there. Yeah. And so on those leaders, um, and that makes total sense. You start, you know, you're building your first leader. You mentioned the, the one X up down to the five X on that. And you mentioned the, the softness of the leader. Now, are you talking about the overall, is this something where you can just buy a leader off the shelf, um, and put this together or talk about how you build that? So basically what I do is on my end, I buy some equipment from a brand called Duval. Duval. How do you spell that? It's D-E-V-A-U-X. It's a French brand. Uh, and they send me tons of spools of different things. And they have a lot of stretching uh, material in those spools. And so I build my leader out of it. Um, I use some of their tippet. I use some of Orvis tippet. I use some of Rio tippet. Uh, and personally, I don't use fuel carbon. So that's the thing. Uh, to me, fuel carbon is too stiff. It disturbs my fly, especially when you get into the very thin stuff. So I, I rather sacrifice visibility for presentation. For presentation. And you like the soft... The softer, like you said, is good because it helps with the presentation. Does it also help with casting, or is casting harder as it gets softer? Well, it's it get the casting is is like everything else. It's something you have to pick up, but when you master it, it's very easy to do. It's like I mean, you can tie your shoe at two o'clock in the morning in total darkness. You can't see it and you tie your shoe. It's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do, but you do it. Yeah, you can do it. That's right. Okay. So t- walk us through the leader and then we'll move on to the casting. So on the leader, um, break us down. If you go from the fly line, you've got this, um, you know, the scientific anglers. So I go to from, from the fly line. I do not use a loop to loop connection. I have a direct knot to my fly line. What's the knot you use? Well, the, the loop to loop is great. It's easy. The problem is it creates a, a disconnection in the middle of your system. 
So I don't want that. So I use, I use, you know, whatever nut you want, nail nut, uh, surgeon's nut, whatever you want. But I have a direct connection from my fly line to my leader as tight as possible. And then I taper it down slowly. And most of my leader are going to be, for your name thing, they're going to be fairly, they don't taper down fast. I mean, it, and it, again, that is a very big question because depending on where you are, you're going to change that. I mean, if you want to get acute into it, there is a leader for every situation. Oh, right. Well, let's take it to a situation. Let's say we're on the Farmington and there's probably lots of variation there, but I don't know. And I don't know the Farmington, so I'm not sure what the water looks like, but I'm assuming there's some faster water. Are you fishing a lot of riffles, runs, deep pockets? How would you be, you know, farm, would you doing all sorts of things there? Let's put it this way. Let's, let's look at, for example, uh, a go-to leader. You know, that's like, for example, you know, you go dry fly fishing, you have a nine foot five weight that, you know, you get away with murder with this. So let's, let's find the leader that gets away with murder. My leader is going to be approximately 25 to 30 feet long. It's going to be made out of a monofilament that's 0.20 millimeter, which is 3X. That material is going to be extremely stretchable. It's going to be bicolor. At the end of that, I'm going to have a piece of tippet 3X, same diameter, that is clear, that is also stretchy. Then I'm going to take another piece of that leader and attach it. It's going to be my cider. And my cider can be anywhere from six inches long to two feet long. That is a preference style. Some people like it long. Some people like it short. Uh, and then a tippet ring, two, two millimeter tippet ring. So the smallest one you can find in the market. And then I put a piece of 5X. I make a quadruple surgeon's knot with a loop at the end. I open my loop and I got two flies. And my flies are approximately 18 inches apart. 18 inches. Okay. And my heaviest fly is at the bottom, the point fly. And that gets away with me almost in any situation. And depending on the speed of the current and the depth of the current, I will change the size of the fly. But with this system, I mean, you pretty much can get away with murder everywhere. Yeah, that's it. That's your typical setup. Yeah. So you don't have you don't have to go far. You know, you can cast very short. You can cast a little longer. It's very stretchy. It's light. It doesn't bulge under your tip rod. It doesn't bring your fly back. You get away with murder. Okay. So now let's take it to the river. So we're on the Farmington, and there's probably lots of areas to cover. But, um, you know, let's just say we're out there fishing. I mean, what would the typical water, what are you looking for to find fish on the Farmington? Are you looking for certain types of, like, runs versus riffles, stuff like that? So it all depends on the time of the year. Fish move. Uh, so depending on the time of the year, like for example, early in the spring, they're still in holes. They're still deep. Uh, they're not moving much. They're sluggish. So you take bigger flies. You go very slow, very close to the bottom without touching it. That's another thing. I don't touch the bottom. Never. Okay. So never. So if you're touch, if you feel the bottom, then you're going too deep. You're too deep. Well, the bottom line is if you touch the bottom, you're going to catch rocks and, and twigs. I mean, that's what you're going to catch. Uh, and fish don't look down. They look up. So, yeah, but it's, it's just the wrong, idea, the wrong approach. But ticking the bottom is not a good idea. Uh, so I try to drift, you know, six inches, four inches above the bottom. How do you know if you're four inches above the bottom and not, say, um, like 18 inches above the bottom? So there are different way of looking at it. Uh, some fi some people fish the top water first and then go down, and then some people try to find the bottom and then shrink their tippet to be at the right depth, and then will fish up. In that game, you can use two siders, so you dip the first siders down first. And then, and then on the second drift, your second drift is going to be in the clear section on between siders. Then the third cast is on the top of your second siders, and then halfway through your second siders, and at the bottom of your second siders. 
And so you fish different zone, different depth. And the key is to find where the fish are, which is, you know, when you find one, you find the rest. Okay. And then if we come to the river there, let's say we just jump in the, look at the Farmington and you just, you look out and you see a bunch of water, riffles, all, how do you know where to find the fish? And let's take it to springtime. You said they're in deeper water. So let's just start there for a sec. You're in spring. So in the spring, they're going to be in deeper pocket. They're going to be in slower water, uh, no matter what. They're in slow water, no matter what. And the slow water is adjacent to a current. That's where the fish are. Gotcha. So the pillow water. So you might have a deeper run, but maybe they're going to be on the outside of that in the slower, calm water, calmer. Exactly. It's the compression zone on between a slow and a fast moving water. Gotcha. And then you can fish that water because there is some movement. Are you talk about how you would fish this Euro setup? Because that's another challenge, right? Like if you don't have the right current speed. Yeah. So one of my key, uh, one of the things that I really try to do when I fish is try to fish as slow as possible, which means I try to slow down my fly as much as possible. So the current on top is faster than the current at the bottom. And fish are in a zone usually that move at one or two feet per second. That's where the fish are. Uh, and you want your cider to go at that speed and not faster. Which means your fly are traveling in slow pocket of slow water and you're barely leading your fly. In some situation, you can feel the current pushing your flies. And then you just lead them just a little bit. So you're just ahead of them. And that's it. I mean, at that point, it, your cider is almost vertical and you're just ahead of it, just a tiny bit. Could you fish this in a, say, water that almost doesn't have any current or maybe is even going upstream? Could you just direct it in that sort of water as well? So in slow moving water, your nymphing is not the preferred way to fish. No. I mean, at that point, I'm almost better off with an indicator floating on top. Gotcha. You got to have some current. So some current and you're looking at might be a run on the edge of a run or are you fishing on the Farmington or are riffles? Are you finding good fish in riffles? Tons of fishing riffles in the summer. I mean, in the summer, they're all there uh, in the riffles and you go pocket of pocket by pocket one at a time, uh, moving a lot and you pick up tons of fish that are just waiting to eat your fly. Okay. And what is on that river? I mean, like size of fish. Are there like mostly smaller, or bigger? Because what, what, I've seen some photos out there, some pretty big fish. Yes. Yeah, so when you look at the Farmington and you look at all river, I, I mean, I fished all over the place. I would say the Farmington has a good consistency, good, a good amount of big fish. I mean, picking up a 20 inch plus is not uncommon. 20 inch, and that's usually probably a 20 inch brown. I mean, yes. I mean, we, we we see rainbow in that size too, but they're stuck. But we, we see wild over 20 inches quite a bit. Uh, they're always in the same spot. They're always hiding in the same place. Uh, when you go on the Farmington, you can catch fish that are virtually four inches long. As well, you can catch fish over 20 inches. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And how do you find, what's the what's the key to finding some of those bigger fish is the technique is, are you going to find those with a Euro or is that more like fish and streamers or dries or what's that look like? For example, like right now, streamers work very well. Big nymph works very well. Uh, you get into the spring, uh, you start to go smaller in size of nymph uh, and you go, you know, you start to, you know, agitate some dry fly here and there. Then you get into the summer, and during the summer, I mean, obviously, you try to avoid the nymphing and try to get as many as possible on dry fly because that's probably, you know, to my taste, it's the most fun. And you can bring fish to the surface even when they're not rising um, by just putting, giving them something they can't refuse. And when they see it come, they just can't refuse. Even if they're not rising, they see it, and they just come up and pick it up. That's right. Well, let, let's get in that. So on the Euro, let's uh, tie that up here. So on the Euro nymphing, <clears throat> um, I'm sure there's lots of more you know, details, but uh, any other, before we move on to dries for a little bit, anything else you want to highlight? Any tips on the Euro game? The only thing I would say on the Euro game is move a lot. If it doesn't work, change. I mean, move, change, evolve, be dynamic, 
and that's the key. That's the key. And look around. I see a lot of people, they get out of their car, they walk in the river, they don't look, and they go fish. And it's just like they spook more fish than they will ever catch. Uh, look, just look. Sit on the bank, take a good 15, 20 minutes, and look. And those, those, what you're going to see is going to be surprising. You're going to see flash. You're going to see fish, maybe fish rising. You may see some movement subsurface. You may see fish chasing out the other fish. You may see a whole lot of stuff going on. You may see bugs flying around. You may see birds flying around. Where are they flying? Are they flying up, up, up in the air or down low to the water or, you know, mid-air? I mean, where are they? Uh, you know, looking is key. Um, I mean, it's like hunting. Uh, you got to look. If you take a, a, a person that hunts for birds, you rarely see them shooting in the blue sky waiting for a bird to fall. I mean, they won't have to say more than that, but that's exactly what it is. Right. I like that analogy. The hunting is basically, yeah, we're hunting. And if you were hunting an animal, um, bird, whatever it is, you definitely are going to take your time before you take a shot. You're going to get everything lined out. And if it's not lined out, you shouldn't take the shot, right? Exactly. Every cast should deserve a fish. Yeah. Is that how you feel when you're fishing down there with a client? Do you always feel like they, they every shot they have a, a good chance at a fish? Oh, yeah. And if it doesn't work, we know why, and we tweak it, and we do it again. Yeah, that is one of those things because with fly fishing, especially with dries, you know, you're out there, you're okay, okay you got this fly on, you think it's going to work, and then you make a cast and, you know, you don't catch anything. And then you start thinking, well, was it the fly or was it my cast? What would be the advice you'd tell somebody on that? You can't question yourself. Okay. So you need to be a good caster. You need to cast well. You need to be confident. Uh, you need to plan. You need to have an attack set up. Then you make your cast, you make your drift, and it could be nymphing as well as dry fly fishing, and then you, you should expect a strike anytime. And if that doesn't work, you change. Because if it doesn't work, there's no reason it's going to work the next cast. You can sit there and plant roots all year round. Maybe during the year, you're going to have uh, four or five days on a row. It's going to be wonderful. And the rest of the time, nothing is going to happen. Are you able to see fish if there's a hatch coming off and you're just sitting there observing? Is it easy to watch and say, hey, there's a big fish, there's a small fish, and actually go for that big fish? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You train your eyes for that. Yeah, what are you looking for to know the big fish? I mean, can you, like, how would you tell if it's a big fish versus a small, if they're just kind of sipping or, you know, hitting dries, small dries? The bigger fish, number one, they're bigger. So they move more water. Uh, they usually are slower. Uh, you can see change of shade of color at the bottom. So you have your bottom and it's brownish. And suddenly you have for a split second, it's the brownish is just a shade lighter. And then it goes back to the regular brown. That little change tells you there's a fish there. And then you pay attention to that spot and you'll see fins moving. You'll see a shadow of the fish. You'll see, you rarely see the whole fish, but you'll see part of them. And those portions you see will tell you approximately how big they are. And again, we go back, we go back to observe, look, don't cast. No, no, no. When I go after a big fish, I may look at that fish for hours on end. And then I position myself and I wait for that fish to position itself into a castable zone. And then I make one cast. And that's it. I mean, I've been on the baton kill on days where I position myself. I mean, during the day, if I make five casts, I'm happy. I'm not fishing. I'm hunting one beast. Are you saying you might make five casts during the day or just during one short session? No, no, during the day because I'm hunting one fish. I'm going to go and look and look at it for hours on end, see where he is, where he goes, where is his house, where is his living room, his dining room, his basement, what does he do during the day, and I might come back the following day and, and observe more at different time of the day, and now i got a better idea of where he is, what he does, 
and where he will be able to take a fly and where can I stand to make a presentation to him without being seen and where I could be successful. It's, it's hunting. But then that fish takes that fly. It's total success. Yeah. And then when he takes that fly, do you find after you hook him, release him that, you know, the next day you're, you have an opportunity to catch that fish again or a week? Usually a wild big fish, when you hook them, you have an explosion of bubbles subsurface the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And after you put them in the net, you release those fish and you rarely see them again. It's like somebody in the house. You, they're watching TV. You arrive behind them and you poke their head with a hammer. That guy is going to turn to his wife and say, this house is spooked. There's a ghost here and we're moving tonight. I'm not staying in here another day. Yeah. So they're out of there. So those fish are basically, they're down for the count and they're going somewhere else. Oh, yeah. There's some big fish. You catch them. They're dumb. You, you catch them over and over again. I mean, I have a couple of them. There is Victor. There is uh, Adelaide. You know, those, I give them names. Uh, and those, they just, they're dumb as a bucket of rock. And you can catch them over and over again. And they still come back. And, you know, they, they, I mean, it's real estate for us guide. You know, we put them back. We know where they are. And if you need to catch a fish, that we go see Victor. That's cool. Yeah, no, I love that insight. That is, I love, I love the way you think because I think the way you're thinking is it's not about speed or going to tons of different holes. It's really about observation sitting there. And if you have to make five casts all day to get one amazing fish, that's, that's what you have to do. Yeah, I've been days on the river. I haven't cast once. Carrying my whole thing all day. I've been walking all over the place. I've been looking all over the place and I have not cast a single time. Because it's not worth a cast. And if I was casting, I would spook the whole place. I would disturb and all what I would have learned during that period of time would, would have been eliminated. Today's episode is sponsored by Country Financial. The fires in the Northwest and throughout the West in, in the last few years have been devastating for thousands of people. Uh, those folks, some folks have lost their homes, their belongings, uh, and their sense of safety has all been challenged. This is why insurance and protecting your assets are so critical. Dalton at Country Financial is here, and he was on the front lines during the fires, handing out checks to Country Financial community members, providing drinks, food, and more. And each time Dalton meets up with a client, he does an extensive review of their current assets and coverage. This is his opportunity to really decide and let you know what you need uh, to make educated decisions for your insurance needs. This is a super critical piece. And Dalton Roy, Roy loves it. He loves getting out in the rural community, connecting with people, loves the outdoors, fishing, hunting, everything that goes with it. And so I'm excited to be sharing uh, Country Financial and Dalton with you. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash country right now to get started. That's C-O-U-N-T-R-Y. Check out Dalton and support this podcast in a great local company right now. What if somebody needs to practice? They're not that great of a fly caster. Do you recommend, you know, would it be okay if they went out there and just flogged the water all day to get better? Or should they be doing that, you know, on the grass? There are two approaches. My approach, number one, it's let's do it on a parking lot or in a place where you have grass, uh, where you have, you know, plenty of space so you don't squirrel fish, you know, don't get caught in trees and antennas of cars and who knows what. Uh, but then you need to be on the water and cast in the water because the tension of the line on the water is different than on a parking lot. So you got to get used to it. And even yeah, you know, at that point, you're not fishing. You're practicing your cast on water. Last summer, we had that guy that came from France. We were looking at one very specific presentation, which is you're presenting a dry fly in a downstream manner, but you're presenting that dry fly upstream from the angler. So you're doing a downstream presentation, which means you, know, you cast downstream and you can wiggle your fly and make it move upstream towards you. And that works very well because bugs go upstream. The problem is the fish sees you. So he's not really, in the pressure water, he's not really willing. I mean, a bigger fish is not going to come up and, and pick up your fly. You may fool some stock fish doing this, but that's about it. Now, 
if you are in a place and you walk upstream and suddenly you see on the seam, you know, in that compression zone, you see a nice flash or something like this, you're just like, okay, so you got a nice fish over there. You cast upstream into that seam. That fly is on that seam. You immediately roll cast upstream and you, re you just now are placing your leader and your cider. There's a cider on the dry fly leader. You're replacing all of that upstream from the fly. So basically, you have your fly in front of you, upstream from you. You have your leader going further upstream, looping down back at you. And all you have to do is take the tip of your rod and wiggle it on the way downstream. And that fly will go upstream because the leader will pull it up. There you go. So, And when are you wiggling it? If you know where the fish is, when do you wiggle it upstream, the fly upstream? When it arrives at a couple of feet in front of the fish and you wiggle that thing and that fish is going to look at it and just going to be like, ooh, yummy, snack. So you're saying with the dry fly, an important piece of the dry fly fishing is to not just let it sit there stagnant floating down river. You want to give it some action. Sometimes and sometimes you don't. But bugs are alive. Bugs move. So I use a lot of CDC. And that CDC has those little fibers that touch the water and they wiggle. They look awfully like legs. And then I don't pay too much attention to the hatch force. I mean, I do pay a lot of attention to it, but I go away a little bit and I'm thinking a lot about the silhouette of my bug, a lot more than the real thing. I don't fish a fly that's going to catch fishermen. I fish, I'm fishing a fly that's going to catch fish. So my flies are based on a lot on the silhouette of the bug. And you get away with murder doing that. I mean, if you put in the water a dry fly that has legs that move, that is going upstream, uh, that's struggling on the water, I mean, the wild fish are going to see it and say, oh, nice handicap, let's eat them. Yeah. You mentioned the cider uh, on the dry. Is, is there a reason you use cider with the dry flies? Yes, so, so you know where your tippet starts. So from your cider to your fly, you know how much distance you have. So you can let it go, you can tighten it, you can move your fly, you can loosen it. Uh, you can replace your cider in different places around your flies without moving the fly. Uh, you can do a lot of things. And for dry fly fishing, I do not fish under 16 feet. 16-foot mm, leader. The minimum. 16 foot. Okay. And, and then is that also with the line, with just normal dry fly line? So normal dry fly line, direct connection to my leader, no loop to loop. And then it tapers down. All that leader is made out of stretchable material. Uh, and it's at least 16 feet. There's no tippet ring. There's no nothing, no tag. There's a cider. No knots? Well, the knots you have. Yeah, but there's no little ear stag that people have. No, 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 none of that. And then, uh, yeah, it's 16 feet, uh, including my tippet. And, it, and sometimes it goes longer. It goes 20 feet, 24 feet. I mean, it depends on the situation. But, I mean, with a 16-foot long leader, you get away with murder almost anywhere. How long are your casts on the Farmington, on, on average, dry fly fishing? A short. Long cast don't pay. You can't set the hook. It's nightmarish. 20 feet or shorter? No, no more. You can go 30, 40, 50 feet. But you're not going to go cast 80 feet. You're not casting into your backing. No, no. Okay. But you're using your normal. So basically you're casting, say, 50 feet might be a longer cast. That's a longer cast. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, let's talk about the hatches real quick throughout the Farmington. So take us there, you know, um, let's just start in the spring. I'm assuming that well, there's probably some hatches in the winter as well. Um, but w what do you get excited for when you think hatches on the Farmington? They used to have a big hatch, which was the Hendrickson. And because of water tap and going up and down like crazy, and it's not, it's not as stable as it was before, the Hendrickson have suffered a lot from it. So from being a, ma a massive hatch that was very long in duration and very long in length, we have now an, an, an Edrickson that's very short and in length and in duration. And when is that? When is that hatch? 
that ad should start usually at the end of April and get into May. Uh, 15 years ago, we would start on April 27, and we would have ads starting at 11 a.m. and go on until 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, and this will go on the whole month of May, and you would go upstream and find Hendrickson near the dam mid, mid-June. Nowadays, we are looking at it occur in the first two weeks of May. It lasts maybe a week, 10 days. It starts at 2 o'clock. It's done at 3 p.m. It's very short. Uh, it's no longer what it was. Then following that, we have the Glamour Hatch, which was nothing 15 years ago and now is in prolific all over the place. It's the sulfur. The sulfur are everywhere. And it's just a fabulous hatch. The fish love them. They key on them very easily. It's an easy fly to fish because you can see it very well. Uh, I mean, it's a complete blast. And the hatch, the, the hatch goes on all day long. It stops for half an hour. It starts all over again. It's a great bug on the river right now. Tons of caddis. Uh, we see caddis all over the place. Then that summer, we have all our trigger flies. And then we have all those ants. We have beautiful flying ants hatch on Farmington. We have ant, black ants on the river every day. Um, so the Chernobyl ant, all those ants do very well. And then you get into September, which is a dead month. Uh, there's very little bugs. Fish are difficult. Uh, it's always a difficult month. I don't know why. Uh, not much is happening. So there you have to up your game and you know, getting really tight on everything you do. You know, it's no longer like uh, the months of June where whatever you do, you're going to catch something. Uh, that's no longer the game. Now you've got to be really, really looking for them, paying attention to what you do. Do not make any mistakes. Uh, you've got to be on top of your game. And then the leaves come down, the fish spawn, and next thing you know, you get into the fall, and the fall is beautiful. We fish egg pattern, we fish nymphs, we fish streamers, and again, the fishing is outstanding. And are there any uh, fall and winter hatches going on? So in the winter and the fall, we have, all year round, we have those blueing olives, and we have them in all different sizes, so that we have them all year round. Um, and then we have winter caddis in the winter. Uh, they're little caddis, and they are, I mean, they could be freezing out there, and they still hatch. Because the water from the dam is coming out, that uh, it's not freezing. So, you know, the first 10 miles down the dam, the river doesn't freeze, even when it's very cold. Perfect. So that gives a little rundown. What's the, so the sulfur is an interesting one. What would be a fly that would be matching the sulfur hatch that somebody might know? So I fish them fairly small. So I fish them in a 20, 22 size. Uh, ear, body, yellow. Uh, ears, ears, wing. Tiny little tail. Very simple. That's it. Or you can put a um, seal fur, yellow, as a body. Coq de Lyon for the tail. And then uh, you wrap a wrapping of CDC in the entire length of the body and dump it in the water. And the sulfur is a, that's a mayfly? It's a mayfly. It's a yellow bug. Yeah. It's a fairly small fly. Yeah. Big wings, but fairly small. But like a small would be what, 18? Yeah. I mean, 18, 20, 22, and all in that range, they will work. You know, you pick and choose. Sometimes they, they key on smaller ones. Sometimes they don't mind. Okay. So... And there's obviously lots of different styles, but it's more the color. That yellow color makes it unique, right? The sulfur versus, say, any other mayfly out there. Yes. I mean, they're bright golden yellow. Bright golden yellow. Yeah, I got you. So they're bright golden yellow. So you get that. And then the type of fly, whether it's a parachute or a comparadon or, a, you know, whatever else you could use, traditional cat skills. How would you choose that? Like, would any of those flies work or does it vary? Um, so I have all of them in my box. And that, that is trout for you, is someday they will take one, 
the following day, exactly the same condition, same place, same everything. They will not touch it. They want a different one. And they'll take the one that are tied with silver more than the one that are tied with Yaz Air. Or they'll take a parachute more than a than an Adam style or vice versa. It really depends on the date. You should have a mix of fly patterns. You should have a mix. Yeah. And then are you also can you fish that like any sort of a, a merger or other like nips as well? Yes, absolutely. So just before the hatch, you nymph them out with yellow nymph. Then before the hatch, also, you can uh, fish them as a wet fly and you swing them in the water going up. They love that. And then you fish them as an emerger. You fish them as a dry fly. Uh, when the evening comes, you fish them as a spinner. We have beautiful spinner fall. Oh, and I forgot, and I completely forgot. I mean, that is awful on my part. We have ISO on the water, Isonica. So those are big bug, red body, size uh, 12, 14, depending on, on where you are. Do you know how to spell that one? Yeah, it's I-S-O-N-Y-C-H-I-A. Yeah, I, I, Isonica. Yeah, that one's a harder one. <laughs> yeah, Isonica. We call them ISO. Yeah, ISO. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah, that's right. I supply, yeah. And those are big bug, and they don't hatch in great number, but they hatch all over the place, one here, one day, and the fish knows about them. So uh, you go in the fast water, nothing is, is uh, hatching. You dump one of those big fly in the fast water, and out of nowhere, you'll have fish coming out of it. It's a lot of fun to fish that fly. That's not a mayfly, right? That's a different bug. It is a mayfly. The ISO is a mayfly. We have a major hatch in June and going into um, July. And we see them in August upstream. And then we have another hatch end of September, somewhere in there. It depends. Every year is different. But uh, And then, I mean, yeah, from, uh, from the months of end of May to you can see them all the way to mid-October, mid-November. It depends on the year, but, but it's, a, it's a great fly to fish. I mean, it's a big fly. You see it. Um, it's always an explosive take, so it's, it's fun. Yeah, Isonychia. Yeah, that's one I've heard about. So And the sulfurs and... So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like pretty much everything we haven't, you know, touched on all of it, but that gives us a little rundown. And if somebody wanted to, um, you know, fill their box up, do you guys have a local fly shop out there in your area? Okay. So we have, we have, obviously we have the Orvis store. Oh yeah. There's Orvis. Where's that at? That's in Avon, uh, which is 20 minutes away from the river. Uh, and then on the river, we have another store called Upcountry. And upcountry has everything. They're knowledgeable. You can ask them questions. They're always there to help. Um, it's a good gang of people. Um, and I'm lucky to have those two around because I know some guides across the nation that don't have good stores near them. And it's virtually a nightmare for them. They have to order stuff online. I mean, it's just like, no, that doesn't work. Gotcha. You, you mentioned, let, let's, uh, we're going to take it out here pretty quick, but I was curious on the Orvis. You mentioned, uh, Pete Kutcher, right? Yeah, Pete Kutzer. Yeah, Big Pete Kutzer. What was was he? I mean, he, he was probably. I'm sure he's such a great caster. Is there anything that you think of that really you learned from Pete um, over those years of working with him? Or I'm not sure how closely you guys worked together. Well, we worked every day for almost seven years, so we're pretty close. Was he the casting guru back then when you were working with him? Yeah, we we're all casting guru. We're just having fun with this. I mean, it's just. Uh, uh, we love to fish together. We love to uh, we love to have fun together. We love to discover. Uh, we love to. We have a very similar approach of fishing. So um, you know, now he's in the corporate world, so it's maybe a little different on his part. But I mean, I talk to him every year. We try to fish at least one or twice every year together. And when we do, we just have a good time. And when when you look at the end of fishing. Uh, having a good time is uh, is the main main part. I mean, you know, you're there to have fun, so that's that's the whole thing. And then I want to mention one thing that we have not touched on. I recently saw something very interesting called swim well, and I think we're going to see a lot of that very soon. It's a it's a spray, 
and basically you're spraying oxygen on the fish. And fish not only breathe through their gills, but they breathe through their body. And so you spray this on the fish and it helps the fish recover after a fight. And I think we're going to see this more and more, this kind of approach. It, I think uh, I'm, I'm testing this soon and I'm pretty excited about this. We'll see. But I, I suggest everybody to look at it because I think that could be a cool thing to do. We'll look that up. That's I have not heard of that swim well. Essentially, it's almost like, well, I guess it's different, but it sounds like the, I remember those Axe body wash commercials. You remember those where you'd spray the... <laughs> You'd spray the uh, the body stuff on your thing. I mean, this is obviously a little different, but I, I pictured the same thing out of an aerosol can, literally spraying the fish. It's going to be presented at the fishing show in uh, Denver. I think it's going to be the first appearance of that. We'll put a link in the show notes to that because that is interesting. Yeah, I think people should look into it because it's it, it doesn't hurt anyone. It can only help the fish. Uh, it's It goes in line with a lot of things that we are looking for that we're doing. And, uh, yeah, if you can save one fish during the year, hey, listen, good enough for me. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think, it, you know, along with that reminder is just the, it kind of reminds us on the handling of fish, right? So you probably don't want to be fishing when the water's too warm. And if you have a fish on, you don't want to play it out too much. You want to get it in. So you, right. Using the right gear. And people take a lot of pictures. Yeah. Too many pictures and keep them wet. Right. Yep. Yep. It's all in the same line. So this doesn't replace that. This doesn't replace that, but it maybe would help a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Everything we can do to help. You know, you pick up a can of uh, of an empty can on the side of the river, put it in your pocket, dump it in the garbage can. Everything helps. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Well, well, let's uh, let's take. We got a quick little segment here called the uh, the, the two minute drill. This is I've been forcing myself to take us out of here. With I'm going a little bit too long. So these will just be some quick little questions, easy ones you can answer. Um, as we go ahead um, here. So you mentioned the local shop. We can check that off the list. What is your, on the farming tin, you know, if you had to pick the, your one fly, what do you got there? What, and let me start the timer here. We'll see if we can get out of here in two minutes. So just give us a quick little one, quick answer, and then we'll keep moving on. If I had to pick one fly, it would be a size 16 perdigon black with a red butt. There you go. Yeah, the perdigon. Okay, perfect. That's your one fly. What's a one tip to get out of here? So we got a tip to give somebody on... Um, just fishing in general there on the Farmington? Uh, if you're not catching fish, change. Yeah, right. If you're not catching fish within, say, uh, like you said, maybe a cast. If you're not catching fish, you're not fishing. Yeah, perfect. Are there any um, places up there, lodges, places to say if somebody wanted to come in? What would you recommend if they were coming into that area they wanted to, you know, are, is there any places there? Is it more like B&Bs? So I, I like Legends. I don't know if you heard about them, but they're right on the river. It's a nice lodge. It's bed and breakfast. And then people go there and they meet other anglers and, you know, it's fun. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Perfect. And it um, sounds like you spend most of your time out there. Any plans to get out back to Europe and do some trips, any big trips over there you'd like to hit? Oh, yeah. We want to fish everywhere. We've been looking at some stuff over there. I mean, what what is a good place? If you wanted to go over to Europe and really hit a, hit a, a spot, I, mean, I know there's tons of places, but where would be a good country or spot to hit up if you've never been there? So if I had one place to fish before I die, I would go back in the old river in the Pyrenees. It is beautiful. The fish are gorgeous. Uh, and the food is delicious. I mean, you can't beat that. Yeah. And this is, uh, and remind us again, where is this part of the, what country? It's in the Pyrenees at the border of Spain. It's on the eastern part of the Pyrenees, uh, adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. And Spain is obvious. That's a huge, huge place that everybody should probably check out. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you look at the best team on the planet, it's Spain and France and Czechoslovakia. But French and Spain definitely are there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're right there. Awesome. Well, some of this we might have to leave for another episode because there are a lot of questions that I, I'm leaving on the table here. But give us one resource. So somebody is uh, going to be fishing the Farmington. If they can't connect with you, where would you tell them to go to kind of learn more about the Farmington? Uh, there are two other guides that are really good. Uh, Derek Kirkpatrick, that's called City Flash Guy, Fly Guy. Uh, and then Zach, Zach Saint-Amand. He's a good guide also. 
So the three of us, we're, we're close together. Uh, when I need help, I call them up. When they need help, they call me up. Uh, we do a lot of stuff together. Um, that's another thing. We, we created a little organization called the Farmington River Guide Association. So the, we are one of the rare river on the planet where guides don't hit each other with rocks. We all like each other. We have pizza together. We have beer together. We chat. We help each other. Uh, it's a very nice thing to have uh, to have around. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, Antoine, uh, I think we'll leave it there and we'll send everybody out. I guess the French Fly Fisherman is the easiest place. Probably just Google you up. We'll put a link to your uh, website as well and your and your phone number. But yeah, appreciate all the time today and shedding some light on that neck of the woods. This is our first time in Connecticut, so oh. it's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting to hear about the Farmington. And I know there's a lot of people. We have a lot of folks out in the Northeast. It's a great place. We have people coming from all over the planet. Yeah. Good. We'll add a few more to the area if you don't mind. I hope it's not too busy. Is it? How, how are you guys doing on, on is it is it busy there or does it feel pretty good? Well, right now the water is pretty high. Uh, it's it's snowed, so we're all under under snow right now. So it is not quite ideal. <laughs> no, it's not ideal. When's the best time if you want to avoid the traffic and get? You said the fall, right? That's a good time. The fall, even July, there are usually less people, and, and boy, the fishing is great. Okay, perfect. All right, we'll keep in touch with you, and we will talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Dave. So there it is, wetflyswing.com slash 424, 424, to get some show notes, links, and everything else we talked about today. Quick listener shout out before we uh, start to head out of here today. Shout out to Tom Fonaroy. Uh, Tom reached out by email. He said he just uh, just signed on to the podcast and he was checking out the Ed Jaworowski episode. Tom said he lives in Maryland and he is only about three hours away from Ed. So uh, so he wanted to hopefully connect with Ed Jaworowski and uh, maybe get a casting lesson. And uh, and he was hoping we can forward him some contact information, which I did. I checked in with Ed. And Tom, uh, I want to say that's on the way to you. So thanks in advance for checking. uh, Actually, thanks for checking in with us today. If you want to get a shout out on this podcast like Tom or get an episode or connection with with any of our past guests, you can send me an email, Dave at Wetfly Swing, and, uh, and I can put that together for you. All right, we're heading into the Stillwater Week next week. We're going to be giving away a big trip uh, up to BC, Canada, British Columbia. Uh, we got Phil Roy coming back on. We're going to do a big week on Stillwater, the Northern Lights Lodge. If you haven't checked this one out, Northern Lights Lodge is where we're headed. Uh, you can check them out right now and see what they have going. They have this remote wilderness experience. Their lodge is right in the middle of the wilderness up north, and uh, and they've got some giant, uh, giant rainbows, giant bull trout. They cover a little bit of everything on this. We're going to be talking about Stillwater all next week, so stay tuned for that. Um, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash trips, T-R-I-P-S, anytime to check out and uh, and sign up to get updated when our next trip goes live. This is going to be a big giveaway, so check it out right now. All right, it was pretty early morning, so I'm wishing you a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and I appreciate you for checking in and listening to the podcast today. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.